coconut. The Trek Geeks Podcast Network is proud to have Fansets as its presenting sponsor. Fansets is the place for amazing pin collectibles with over 200 officially licensed Star Trek pins and new releases every month. Stay tuned for a special discount code good on your next order at fansets.com just for you, Trek Geeks listeners. Fansets, our pins have character. This episode is also sponsored by Science Division, the makers of the galaxy's first interactive tribble that you can control with your very own smartphone. Science Division, trouble's never been this fun. We are the board, and you are listening to the biggest little show this side of the Alpha Quadrant. It's the Trek Geeks Podcast with Bill Smith and Dan Davidson. You will listen. Resistance is futile. You must comply. the Temporal Incursion Department at Podfleet Command Galactic Headquarters. Um, it's actually in a shielded part of the building. We can't tell you where it is, and that's partly because we don't know. We can't find it. Um, yeah, we got to beam in every time we go. It's it's a really kind of a mess, and it's all Dan's fault. It's the biggest little show this side of the Alpha Quadrant, the flagship of the Trek Geeks Podcast Network. Greetings to you, ladies, gentlemen, children of all ages, and welcome to the Trek Geeks Podcast. I'm your co-host, Bill Smith, and this is episode number 241. We are excited to be back. And I say back because we have a story. It's not much of a story, but we weren't here last week, but we are this week. And by we, I do mean my co-host and I. If saving the fate of the galaxy meant eradicating him from the timeline, I just wouldn't do it. Aww. That's It's that simple. Aww. He'd find a way to do it himself. He oh, is right. <laughs> the largely temporal Dan Davidson <laughs> and Dan. Welcome aboard, buddy. Hey, man. It's great to be here. Uh, yeah, uh, apologies for last week. We had planned on uh, having a Chakotay-centric episode to talk about our favorite uh, episodes of Voyager with the first officer, of course, with Voyager 25. But things get in the way sometimes as they do, and we were unable to be here last week. And we ap- actually have to push off that episode until another time because he does deserve an entire episode. Um, but uh, we're back. It's good to be back. It's good to see you. And uh, I'm very excited about what we're talking about this week. Very excited. I am too. You know, uh, the way we see it is Voyager 25 is going to drift into next year simply mm-hmm. because of the fact we haven't been able to celebrate the show the way we've wanted to at conventions and with all kinds of stuff. So 2021 is going to be the year of Enterprise 20 and Voyager 26, and I'm here for it. So we will give Chakotay his due next year for sure. Yeah. In the meantime, tonight, you and I are going to talk about probably my favorite two-parter in Star Trek Voyager. It is my favorite Voyager episode, even if you take them both as one episode. Uh, and it's only fitting that we talk about it here in 2020, which is a year of hell. We're talking year of hell, and I'm very excited. Love this episode. Always have. I've always talked about how it's my favorite Voyager episode. And what would Voyager 25 be without a discussion to find out about counterindications and temporal incursions? <laughs> Even though I said it as Kirk, you know what I'm saying? You really did. Rise. I did, yeah. but that's okay, because I'm just very excited to, uh, to be talking about it, buddy. It's a, it's one I'm really stoked to talk about. It was really the first time Voyager really made me realize that it was the real deal. I remember watching this first run and I hadn't seen Voyager in a while. You know, it was on a, on, on a weeknight on UPN and I watched it and I was like, whoa, our local affiliate played both episodes back to back the second week. And I was just blown away. Hmm. 
And uh, well, one, I made a joke at the time because I was excited that Voyager was destroyed. I was just bummed that it came back. And that's back when I didn't appreciate Voyager. <laughs> uh, so I regret those remarks, Dan. That's very nice. I think a lot of people might want to talk about those remarks. Uh, they may. And how might they do that? See? See what I did there? I'm helping you out. because It was a bit of a for. clumsy segue, it but was, I'll allow it. It was. It was. There's a whole bunch of ways that people can get in touch with us. As always, trekgeeks.com slash contact is the address you want to go to. And when you're there, you can send us an email. You can send us a voicemail. You can chat with us. You can tweet to us. You can do a whole bunch of things right from that location, trekgeeks.com slash contact and as always we are on facebook all the time in our official facebook group it's called camp kittimer it is the most positive trek group on facebook we don't allow any trolling we don't allow any gatekeeping and we only allow people to celebrate what they love about trek all you need to do is search for camp kittimer uh, and you will be um, brought right to the site we'll get you right in so that you can start taking part uh, in that fun and positive page Uh, we want to thank our wonderful admins haley Jackie and Fark for the amazing job they do running the camp. Uh, But it's very important to please remember so that you are not eradicated from the timeline that any comments or messages that you leave us in any of these places, any that you leave us in any of these places may be used in a future episode, Bill. I didn't know we were going to rewind anything. Uh, I don't, I don't know that Anorak specialized in that. Well, you know, the, the, the counter indications and the trace elements were all just kind of fluxing together there and had a little time loop there, but it's fixed now. We have a 98% restoration. We have a 98% chance that I'm just going to delete you from this podcast. <laughs> Dan, the holiday season is now upon us, and as usual, our friends at Fansets have lots and lots and lots of new pins to place in people's stockings, hint, hint, nudge, nudge, wink, wink. Yeah, you know, subtly was never your middle name, buddy, Uh, but you are correct. There are a ton of new pins available right now, just in time for the Christmas holidays. Uh, Five actually launched five new pins on December 1st, Uh, a brand new seven of nine pin in her famous brown uniform, a brand new TNG Commander Riker beard and all. Uh, Here's a big one. The USS Cerritos ship pin finally shipped out. And uh, Bill's holding it in his hand right now. I'm just going to say a happy badgie from Lower Decks and a mad, angry, psycho- psychopathic badgie slash Bill from Lower Decks. And look at he's holding it. See, you guys really need to have cameras. We have evidence on up. Twitter that I'm happy badgie. You are happy badgie. You look just like him. Um, and, you know, here's another one. The 2020 holiday pin was released and it features badgie also. Everybody's favorite holodeck learning program badgie complete with Santa hat and holly and berries and a big red bow absolutely beautiful he's got that big smiling face because he knows you love the holidays and they, he knows you love fan sets and here's another one on december 15th which is just around the corner the uss cerritos bar logo pin will be available and trust me folks you want that pin it's absolutely breathtaking and it's not just star trek dude i gotta tell you there's also a pack of uh batman 66 character pins that's available right now at fansets.com seven characters from the iconic show of the 60s and i know you love that show and i know you love the pins that you already have from fansets for batman so lots of cool stuff the seven characters might already be on their way to casa del bill might want to cancel my order uh, <laughs> <laughs> that is awesome news, buddy. You know, I wouldn't be surprised if Fansets drops some additional unannounced pins in the coming days because lately that's just the way they operate. Um, but until then, listeners, when you place your order at fansets.com at checkout, be sure to enter this week's special Trek Geeks discount code word Anorax. I'm surprised my cohort could spell that. It's A-N-N-O-R-A-X in all capital letters for an amazing 15% off your entire order. And of course, don't forget, when you spend more than 30 bucks at Fansets, you're going to get free shipping automatically in the United States. Now, the special Anorax discount code is going to be available to use until December 16th, 2020 at 11.59 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Both Fansets and everyone on the Trek Geeks Podcast Network wishes you and your families a very happy and healthy holiday season. Fansets, our pins have character. 
And we thank our friends at Fansets for being the presenting sponsor of the Trek Geeks Podcast Network. Well, young Daniel. What? Wow. Here, I mean, if I'm calling you young, that means I too am young by proxy. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah. I, I, I considered my, my words very carefully. I just want you to know that. All right. Um, we're going to talk about the, I have to call it epic. I have to call it landmark. Um, two part Star Trek Voyager episodes, Year of Hell, part one and two, uh, season four, episodes eight and nine. Um, it's, it it is a, a pair of episodes that made me rethink my feelings on Voyager. Mm -hmm. You know, people have definite feelings about every Star Trek series, you know, love, hate, eh, meh, meh is a favorite word of mine, Mm -hmm. but, um, Year of Hell was the really the the episodes of Voyager that made me sit up and take notice and say, this show really is something different, and it can and does stand on its own two feet incredibly well. It absolutely does. I, I got to say, year four in a lot of Star Trek has always been kind of a special year. TNG it was. The original series of... No, sorry. Uh, <laughs> well, sorry. you could say year four was the animated series. Well, there you go. Yeah. Okay. So never mind. No, That's I'm special. Just, I'm just, it is special. It is special. But DS9 had a special moments. This, this season was great. And this, you said it, landmark episodes, this two-parter. And I like to consider it a one-parter because I always watch it. I always watch them together now. There's no way I'm just watching one without watching part two. And it's amazing. It is amazing television. This is, this is to me, the ultimate reset button episode because it does it on such a scale that you don't expect. And even though we've talked about a lot of reset button episodes in the past and whether or not they're good or bad or a waste of time or not, this one is just epic and fantastic on so many levels, um, least of which is guest star Kurtwood Smith. Uh, absolutely. I mean, he has been in so many things over the years, not to mention Star Trek quite frankly. Mm, Yes. But we have seen Kurtwood Smith, who is, by all accounts, an incredibly talented actor. He really gets to play a a very complex character here that we don't often get to see him do in some of the big releases he's done, or even in... True. I mean, a lot of people know him from that 70s show as Red Foreman. Um, Not getting this kind of stuff there, although he was very funny on that show. But he really gets the opportunity to add dimension and layers and and true conflict to this guy. Oh, absolutely. You know, he's. it's funny. We've talked about in the past how some of the movies um, have had the, the villain is the villain because he has lost his mate, his wife, his loved one. We've seen it in so many stories, Star Trek II and, and then the reboot. And when you kind of look at Anorax, it's kind of the same thing. They initially get a 98% restoration at the beginning of this episode. Yeah. And it's not enough because the colony on Kiernan Prime was not restored, which is where the, his wife was. And he says, nope, throw it out. We got to start over. And and that's what his drive is. But at the same time, when they're at one of the home worlds about to eradicate everything, he's about to give the uh, the order to fire. And you can see the conflict on his face before he does it. He takes a deep breath and he shuts his eyes before he says fire. So he knows he's committing genocide. But it's that driving force that makes him do it. And they've been doing it for centuries because they don't age when they're on this time ship. It's, it's really an amazing concept for Star Trek. Alone. Yeah, it is. This is the kind of script that I had hoped we would see for Star Trek Generations. I think if it had not been done for Voyager and this kind of script had been transplanted to next gen with this kind of really, uh, well, we'll debate later whether or not he's truly bad. Um, I, I think this would have been a much more engaging and philosophical and uh, – incredible movie than Star Trek Generations. And I'm sorry, Ryan, from from Patreon, um, <laughs> but I'm, I'm going there. I think that th- this is what I had hoped Star Trek Generations would be. I'm glad that Voyager got this story to do because it really stands up there in, in the best of Voyager. There's every aspect of this episode. I was, I actually, I've seen this one probably more than any Voyager episode over the years. I watched it again just before I came upstairs to record with you today. I was just finishing watching up part one. Every scene is important. 
everyone, yeah. even the yeah. very beginning with the with the Astrometrics Lab being debuted and all the technology they used to it to just to just little scenes like two. Well, it's not a little scene because it's kind of sad. Tuvok shaving with that like freaking guillotine thing that he's holding in his hand and it looks like a mechleth it's it's awesome i love it i want one of those for myself uh, so i can throw it at you um but it's it'd be really it, it it just every single scene is is important and has meaning there's nothing that's filler in this episode for me and that's one of the things that i love so much about it now we should give credit where credit is due we're trying to be better about this yes. um year of hell Parts one and two written by Brandon Braga and Joe Minoski. Part one directed by Alan Croker and part two directed by Mike Vehar. It's hard to believe that two different directors worked on this, on these episodes because. Seamless. Yeah, absolutely seamless. You could have edited these together as one long supercut, one movie, and you wouldn't know. No, I totally agree with you. And 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 I'm glad you brought up. I, I really think this might be one of Brandon's best stories. Without a doubt, I mean, he and and Joe collaborated on this, but you know, we've seen a lot of a lot of episodes um, that he had a part of, but this one this one stands out for me is probably one of the best, if not the best, and yeah. it it just it just stays with you the whole the whole the whole way through. Joe Minoski has done some some amazing work in Star Trek. I mean, most recently he co wrote Leafy for Star Trek Discovery with uh, Ted Sullivan. But throughout his career, I mean, he's got stuff in TNG. Um, you know, it reads like some of TNG's greatest episodes. Yeah. Um, DS9, he's written some episodes. Mm-hmm. Uh, he wrote most of his writing was on Voyager, um, and he's got episodes like The Killing Game, Part One and Two with Brandon Braga, great one. Scorpion, Part One and Two with Brandon Braga. Mm-hmm. Um, it seems like that team worked really, really well together, almost as well as Braga and Ron Moore. Um, but I thought the storytelling was m- far different than it was um, for 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 Braga and more. Yeah, I, I agree. And it, some of the things that I like so much about this, of course, as the story goes with the Krenum and the, and the Zal, the way that they were able to introduce things, like just the first time we see an incursion taking place. And Voyager's part of that incursion in the first one. They are affected as well. Remember when the Zal are wiped out and the little dinky Krenum vessel all of a sudden <laughs> becomes a warship and the little the the little patsy uh, kind of scared commander all of a sudden is just this pompous guy is like, ah, maybe we won't execute your crew. That's the first incursion that we see, and it really it really makes you makes your heart skip a beat for a second saying, What is going on here? Then later, when we see with Voyager's temporal shielding that they're not part of an incursion and everything shrinks down because they're an element that was not supposed to have temporal shielding, it completely destroys what Anorax was trying to do for that particular incursion. It's just another thing that makes you stand – it stands on its head of how how – Amazing the writing was for this episode and the different faction or factors that go into it to make it work so well. Uh, Joe Minoski also wrote one of my favorite Voyager episodes, The Thaw. Yes, the one with the clown. The clown. I love that episode. Joe Minoski writes some really heady stuff at mm-hmm. times. And I appreciate some of the sci-fi he brings to Star Trek. Um, in this episode, in these episodes, we'll, we'll talk about part one specifically now. Time is the ultimate weapon. And that really is kind of mind blowing. The idea that you can remove a molecule or a civilization or a, let's be honest, anything from time and history is, is pretty all powerful. Some might say it's even almost godlike yeah. and, and Anorax is, is this guy. I mean, we know what he's driven by, but he wields this power that is almost unthinkable. It really is unthinkable. It's uh, to be able to just completely wipe out civilizations, knowing with your calculations, but not knowing what butterfly effect that's going to have throughout the galaxy, which we see with those shock waves that go out. It's really interesting to see. And I, 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 you know, I know that they just put it there for the visuals, but I love how on the time ship, they have these charts on the walls or, or these view screens of all the different lines intersecting of which I assume are the differences in the in the time continuum as they're going through all of these processes. It really it really does make you think. But you're absolutely right. That is one of the most ultimate powers to wield, I would think, 
If I was going to be a superhero, that might be one that I would want to have. I'd be Time Man. Dun, dun. Oh, oh my. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what to do with you. Captain Timex. Um, anyway. Voyager really gets the crap kicked out of it. Oh, man. We, I mean, the first time I ever watched this episode, I'm like, oh my God, what do they do to those sets? Because every single last piece of, of that set has damage. Mm-hmm. And it's not just kind of, you know, like it's not pieces of wood and paper flying around. There's debris, there's scorch marks, there's girders. burned out console. There's, yeah, there's yeah. girders. There's, uh, well, we get a great scene in the exterior from a deck exploding. Yeah, deck five. Which is, it, it's some, ama- I'm guessing it's CGI. It's some amazing CGI for the time mm-hmm. considering this was 1997. Yeah. And to think that in this scope of Star Trek, the ship wasn't made spick and span the very next day or the next week um, really explains the gravity and the seriousness of what they're going through. Oh, I, I think it's, it was fantastic to see that. You know, every time a, a commercial, of course, you don't have the commercials when you're watching on Netflix or whatever, but when it comes back, the ship's in worse shape than it was the last time you saw it. And I, I still love how there's like dirt and stuff because Janeway had to like clean off her desk. It's like the dirt came from the ceiling. Like they had like bad ceiling tiles or something like that. That's something that has always been in Star Trek and I've never truly understood it. It's all but- the asbestos. That's exactly right. <laughs> um, but also, you know, like the turbo lifts and uh, there's the great scene, which at the time has a fantastic tie into first contact. Yeah. When Bolana and Harry are trapped in the, in the turbo lift and it turns out the entire turbo lift um, uh, platform is completely dysfunction, dysfunctional. It's completely closed down, not working at all. Um, and Seven ends up uh, showing up to uh, uh, to save those two. But yeah, every time you see the ship, it's worse and worse. When when Tuvok and Seven are going to uh, to the um, deflector controls, as Tuvok calls it, uh, the hallways are not lit. All the hallways are dark and there's stuff hanging on from the ceilings and they're bumping into stuff. And then he crawls along the wall to get to where he needs to go to the bridge when they're under attack. It's it's something you don't see in Star Trek. You don't see a ship that bad. The only other time we see it is when the Defiant was destroyed, pretty much. Yeah. That's about it. And that Definitely. was just a one-time thing. But like you said, this one's a whole episode. Day four, day 30, day 47. I loved how they did that. Yeah, day severe. 47. Um, but every, every time you see the ship, it's kind of um, falling apart a little bit more. The lighting and the cinematography is uh, the some of the best in Star Trek in this episode. Right. They take some amazing low light situations and turn them into really um, weighty scenes that, you, well, I mean, you, you can obviously see the characters, you can see what's going on. It adds a nice element to the story and the drama. Um, to say that Voyager is in a terrible state like it is on day 65 is, is kind <laughs> of an understatement. A little bit. Um, it's Janeway's birthday. May 20th. Uh, May 20th. Mm -hmm. Chakotay goes out of his way to, to give her a gift. Um, you think that's a little tone deaf for Chakotay? Bad bad idea. (laughs) Hey, the crap's falling down around us. Here's a watch. Um, yeah, (laughs) we've had, uh, we've had parts of the ship blow up and be inaccessible. Deck five no longer exists. Have a watch. But you know what? I, he is tone deaf, but I love the way that Janeway handles it. That could be a meal. That could be a hypo spray. That could be a pair of boots. The difference between life or death. Put it back in the replicator. Awesome. I feel like that was a move that didn't necessarily fit Chakotay's character. No. Well, there's a couple things, actually. I'm glad you bring that up, man, because there was one other thing that didn't fit his character to me. In Scorpion, he tells the story um, about the scorpion and stinging the, the fox. And In this episode, when they're in the captain's quarters and she's you know, uh, getting all that asbestos off her desk. He's talking about how we should we should leave the ship, break the team into group of uh, teams, go in shuttles, go in escape pods, and then we'll rendezvous once we get through Krenum space. And Janeway says, "And then what?" And I'm very surprised at Chakotay's remark. Well, we'll cross that bridge when we come to it. What? I. That's not a good first officer answer, in my opinion. That's a weak moment for Chakotay right there, I think. Although he does kind of, you know, walk it back later when he says, oh, I really didn't like the idea myself. (laughs) Ha ha ha, wink, wink. 
I just thought that was like, wow. <laughs> wink, wink, nudge, nudge. <laughs> um, and what a suck up trying to give the captain a watch. They're only in a battle based on time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Good he could point. have Akuche moya the hell out of that and given her something, you know, meaningful. I hope no, it, let's give her a watch. I hope it at least worked. Would that suck if it was stuck at one time? <laughs> <laughs> well, then we'd be right twice a day, right? Exactly. Isn't that well, the old true. adage? Uh, yeah, that's true. Does it still work like that with Starfleet and star dates and all that? I don't know. I don't know. That's a great question. Good question. Um, so <laughs> as, as incursions occur and Voyager becomes more and more damaged, um, they realize that you know, um, it, it's, it's come to a head, you know, the, the things are, are quite dire, especially when, uh, an, I got, I got to be very careful and use the right name. Anorax <laughs> shows up, but I'm going to talk about that in just a second. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Chakotay and Paris get kidnapped, Dumbies. which, you know, <laughs> well, yeah, <laughs> I'm not sure why Anorax would need them, but we'll talk about that in the second part. I hope so. <laughs> um, but essentially, Janeway dispatches all the escape pods with the remaining crew and says, get the hell out of here, everybody. Mm -hmm. yep. um, make your way to the Alpha Quadrant. Um, I'm going to say at impulse, by the way, which will probably <laughs> only take 700 years. <laughs> um, and uh, and maybe you'll meet up with people. Maybe you'll get faster ships, meaning get the hell out of here because the rest of us are going to die, essentially. Right. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And and it's and we just talked about the scene in her ready room a few minutes ago where she's like, I'm not breaking up this family. And then she breaks up the family. Well, admittedly, a lot of days went by in between those two well, events. Yes, absolutely. But what I was gonna say is is even she knew that the time was right to do something so that people would survive. Um so she she made the hard choice as captain. They're all gonna go, she's gonna stay on the ship and try to figure out what to do. To be continued. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and, and she and the senior staff stay behind. I mean, it sucks to be on the senior staff that day. Yeah, it does. <laughs> um, because, hey, guess what? You guys aren't leaving. That includes you, Ensign, and you, Borg lady that we picked up and doesn't actually work for Starfleet. And you, the hologram. You're all staying. Yes. Um, three of you really have no power on the ship at all. Oh, and Neelix. Don't forget him. Mr. Um, Vulcan. <laughs> <laughs> Intruder alert. One of, the, one of the other cool shots in this is seeing the Voyager warp away while parts of its hull are just flying, flying. off. There's no structural integrity. I'm, a thing, I'm amazed the ship can actually travel at warp. It, it, yeah. And it, it, it makes me think about what we talked about already when Deck 5 exploded. Yeah. I mean, that hasn't been fixed yet. I mean, because they show the exterior of the ship later and that whole stretch of Deck 5 is still just a gaping wound. In the hull of the ship, but yeah, that is kind of something that we're not used to seeing in Star Trek either, is the ship that we know and love so much. Oh, there's just bits and pieces flying all over the place behind it as it's warping away, but they have to do it. But it also makes me think, though, when you're in a warp field, wouldn't you be protected from that happening? But I don't I, – we'll have to get Dr. Aaron on again to explain warp again because I don't have any idea. <laughs> you think she wants to cross that bridge again and explain <laughs> warp travel at two morons? Wow. Cross that bridge twice in the same episode. Yeah. Oh, you you're know, welcome. Very well done. You're welcome. I, um, one of the things that, that people talk about in the scope of these episodes was the, the original plan that this should – like be a year long arc. And that was an idea. Obviously it was two episodes. Do you think it's better as two episodes or do you think it would have been better to span over a much greater length of time? I think personally it is better as it is the two parter. The reason I say that is because as much as I have grown to appreciate enterprise Everyone who listens to the show knows that I think the Zindi thing, the Zindi arc was stretched out way too long. And I have a feeling that if they did something like that with this storyline, it would have gotten old faster for me. This does not get old for me with this two-parter. And I think that if it was stretched out over a season-long arc or a half-season arc, it might have. I think it, it, it's, more, it's gotten more of an emotional punch as two episodes, and I think it would as stretched out over six or more. I'm I'm inclined to agree with you. I I appreciate the way this uh, these two episodes are paced. Um, I, I think that if it had gone on to be a full year, 
honestly. Mm -hmm. I think that there would have been too much filler. We saw it, Lee, you brought up a great point. We saw that a lot with the Zindi. Um, yeah. There were episodes in there that just didn't need to occur. And they certainly yeah. weren't part of the arc. They had tangential elements that tied it back. Yes. But you could have removed those and you still would have had a fine episode of Star Trek. Oh, I agree. Yeah, absolutely. Yep. I I I, I appreciate the fact that the writing in this these two episodes were was as concise as it was. Because it allowed, I think, for a much more solid storytelling than we would have gotten otherwise. I abs I I absolutely one hundred percent agree with that. Um, I I as Discovery has has done so well over its two and a half seasons so far, the idea of and Picard uh, and even Lower Decks for that matter, kind of. I think the idea of arc long seasons works in certain aspects. I. I just don't think this one would have. That's just me personally. I can't really put my finger on why I think that. Maybe it's because it's my favorite episode and I don't want it to change at all. That yeah. could be part of the reason why I think that. But I just think it's it's like one of those things, Don't if it ain't broke, don't fix it. And I think that this is a great example of an episode of Star Trek that doesn't ever need to have any changes even discussed about what it could have been. Make sense? Yeah, absolutely it does. We talked a little bit earlier about my having to be sure I said the right name when I called yes. out Anorax. Mm -hmm. And that's because um, throughout my entire childhood, my favorite novel, and I suppose it's even my favorite today, my favorite novel of all time is 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea by Jules Verne. It was the first one that ever captivated my imagination. Um, I first read it in the fourth grade. And it was part of a, it was it, actually, it was, it, it was uh, in school. It was part of the curriculum and we had a chapter a day essentially. And I was, I was mesmerized by it, just the storytelling and you know, the, the visuals that I created in my mind. And, and one of the primary characters in that book is a character called Aranax, <laughs> which isn't, uh, which, uh, you know, uh, Anorax is an anagram of, <laughs> <laughs> but if you look at it, I mean, f truly, Anorax from from Voyager, truly, he's Captain Nemo of the Nautilus. He really is. He is uh, somebody who's out there, you know, uh, whereas Nemo was, you know, searching the oceans, Anorax is searching the galaxy um, to restore what brought him the most pain. Right. From it, the thing that was taken away from him. And... Uh, the the two characters are very similar. Uh, you could have the debate, are they evil? But here they are doing bad things for a reason that really is is very personal and, and speaks to a, a huge hole in their soul. Oh, absolutely. I, and I think that's something that that is important to discuss is that you brought it up earlier when you said, we'll talk about whether or not he's a bad person. No, he's not a bad person. He's doing bad things, but in his mind... He's doing it for a specific reason, and you can tell that he has a problem doing the things he's doing, as I said earlier, when you yeah. see the emotion on his face before he gives the order to fire. Um, there'll be some people that say, well, you know, he's a mass murderer. He's a bad person. Mm. Yeah. And he is. He is. He's a mass murderer, but... There are those who, you know, I, I'll, I'll, I'll be honest, man. If I had the capability of controlling a time ship like that and something happened to Sue and I wanted to get her back, I'd do the same thing. <laughs> so I <beware>. get <laughs> Cause I, I'm done. Um, I, I understand. Well, it, now let me rephrase. It brings a villain to star Trek. That isn't a classic big bad. Like we've seen in the films, like we've seen in some of mm -hmm. the episodes. I mean, you think of other Voyager episodes, you get Henry Starling who is bad. Yes, he is. You know, you get uh captain ransom who is, who's gone bad. Gone bad, yep. There was a good guy there. He gets a little bit of redemption at the end. But here's a guy who, um, for all the for all the wrong reasons, does all the wrong things, but we empathize with him because he's lost something so personal. You know, it he's it's hard to call him a monster, even though, like you said, he's engaged in genocide. And how many countless times has he done it over the hundreds of years? Yeah. How many times has he said fire and erased a civilization from history to try to restore something? And I'll be honest, is very selfish. 
it's very selfish, and and I think he's lying to himself sometimes too. Because one of the things that str- that struck me when I was watching it tonight was he was talking to Obris about how he has to be very specific in his words. And even though it was a ninety eight percent restoration when they um, when they used uh, the Zal home world as the focal point, he said we cannot stop until every person every something, and then every blade of grass is restored, were the words he used. I forget what that second word he was. But he's, but I'm sorry, he's he's lying to himself if he thinks that, because if all of the things took didn't take place in that 98% restoration, but the one thing was the colony at Kiana Prime, he would have stopped doing it. He would have stopped even if his civilization was at a pre-warp state, which is what happened when um, they did an incursion, but Voyager screwed it up with their temporal shielding. He would have stopped if his wife was back. He would have. Yeah, absolutely. Well, we are going to incur some business with America at this time before we talk about the second half of this fantastic episode and our friends at Science Division. Oh my gosh, absolutely. We love to talk about our friends at Science Division. And if you're looking for the perfect gift for the Trekkie in your life, then look no further than the galaxy's first interactive Tribble. You know, that's so true. I mean, these Tribbles are really awesome. You know, for years we've seen stuffed Tribbles at conventions and the like, but the Science Division Tribble is so much more than that. It even sounds like it's right out of Star Trek because it has authentic Tribble sounds that are 100% accurate to the show. It will really seem like this Tribble is truly alive and was beamed to your home right out of a storage compartment on Space Station K-7. I would ex- did not expect that. <laughs> Plus, you know, and I'm going to say this is no lie. The Science Division Tribble is amazingly soft and has the fluffiest Tribble fur in the whole galaxy. They trill. They purr. They even scream. And I'm telling you, this high-quality collectible is truly a must-have for every Star Trek fan. And I'm sure that's largely because Tribbles are not dangerous. Oh my God, you said it, dude. Great job, buddy. Love it. <laughs> Don't get too excited because that's your Christmas oh. gift this year. Oh. And that's because you already have the triple from Science Division, my friend. <laughs> yes, that I do. Uh, and you know what? You can get yours right now. For a limited time, the Galaxy's first interactive triple is on sale for $64 with free shipping in the United States. But that's not all. If you use the special discount code GEEKS, that's G-E-E-K-S in all capital letters, you're going to get a bonus $5 off just for being a Trek Geeks listener. Now, the special discount code is good to use until December 15th, 2020 at 11.59 p.m. Eastern Time. So get your Science Division Tribble today by visiting sciencediv.com. Plus, Tribbles that ship between now and this coming Sunday, December 13th, will also ship with a set of the Tribbles in Vegas photo cards, since we all can't be in Vegas this week when STLV had been rescheduled. Uh, All the more reason to order that Tribble today, Bill. Science Division. Trouble's never been this fun, and we thank our friends at Science Division for sponsoring this week's episode. So, Dan, back to Year of Hell, part de. Yeah. <laughs> or in your case, duh. Duh. <laughs> <laughs> One of the things I like about the second part of this story is that there are much more intimate interactions with characters one-on-one. And by that, I mean Anorax and Chakotay, Janeway and the Doctor, Mm -hmm. um, Obrist and Paris. There is a lot of fantastic scenes, one-on-one, small character type things that really carry most of the weight of this episode. I think you're absolutely right. And that's one of the things I like, but it's also, I got to say, one of the tiny things that I don't like about Year of Hell. And I'll get into that a a little bit, but you're you're absolutely right. There's a lot of of back and forth with camera shots between specific people. And I think that's very important to see where where everybody's mindset is during all of this. I mean, Janeway, she seems to be on some kind of a suicide mission a lot of the time now. You know, she, she gets all that gas in her lungs because she's trying to, you know, you know, put out fires and, and stuff like that. And, and I think that's a very interesting aspect of her character because one of the things I was going to say in, in part one, She's in a bad mood a lot of the time, and she <laughs> she deservedly so. Her ship is in in tatters, but she got third degree burns, dude. <laughs> I think it's a great job by Kate 
in this change that we don't expect to see in Catherine Janeway. But but yeah, here we are, and she's she's um yeah she's not the the, the happiest person to be around. Like you know, put that put that clock away or put that watch away because I got better things to do. I think um, it's because every decision, even more so is life or death Death. magnified times a thousand. I mean, Mm -hmm. it's normally that way for a starship captain, but in this particular instance, every single thing that she gets exposed to or has to make a decision about means they're very survival in this case. And I can see why she's, she's got that mindset and that attitude. Um, because it's, it, it's the most, di- it's, it's as dire as it gets for this crew throughout the entire series. It, it really is. And, and in part two, we see that even more with Janeway and her mood. Um, there's that one part where she needs trioxin to help her breathe. Yeah. And the doctor is going to give her a shot. And she's like, no, that's, that's, that, that's for more important stuff. And he's like, you know what? I'm going to relieve you of duty. And she's like, yeah, who you, who's he going to complain to? Give me the give me the trioxin or whatever it's called. Yeah, trioxin. Yeah, trioxin. And so he, act, the doctor, actually reluctantly does it, and it's a great way to see the mindset of what the captain's like, and even the doctor, who's a hologram. He's he's like, yeah, what what am I going to do? Um, but one of the things I was going to get to was one of the things that that I liked about this episode, which we talked about, was was the compare the the character building between different people. But in my mind, one of the weaknesses of part two, and there's not much weakness at all in this story, is the fact that Anorax allows Chakotay in as easily as he does. You got to think, they've been on this time ship working on restoring timelines for centuries because Anorax talks about the fact that as long as they're in that vessel, they will never be... Um, They'll never age. They'll never be forced to deal with with time because of this special ship. So they've been doing this for a long time. And it only takes a a week or however long for Chakotay to be able to start doing his own calculations for temporal incursions and for Anorax to be trusting of him. And I found that extremely surprising for such a great story. I didn't view it as him trusting him. I viewed it as him grooming him. The more he created an air of trust, the more he might actually get information out of Chakotay with regards to Voyager. Because what he still really wanted to do was, you know, erase Voyager from the timeline. Mm -hmm. Um, He hasn't found them in two months. Um, So I felt like he tried to change his tactic and use sugar instead of salt. That's very interesting. I've never even, I've never even thought of that. I felt like that he was, well, because he says to Chakotay, you know, once Paris leaves the, the dinner of, yeah. uh, of foods from species that no longer exist, which is really dark if you think about it. Um, that's a really, really dark moment. You think? Um, you know, he, it, you know, they talk about how Anorax, uh, Anorax tells Chakotay that he asked a, a good question and he sees something in Chakotay essentially. And Chakotay says, well, you know, I almost failed my temporal mechanics class and blah, blah, blah. And that's when the rapport building starts. Anorax, to me, it seems like Anorax is trying to take Chakotay off his game a little bit, but ha ha, joke's on him. Chakotay is <laughs> never off his game, Akuchimoya. <laughs> um, and, and that's kind of how I've always viewed it. Uh, I'm interested. I mean, I, I think that your interpretation is just as valid. And I mean, I, I, I could be wrong, but I, I it's a, I'll look, I, I won't say you're wrong. I won't say that I'm wrong. But what I think your, your thought process shows is that there's always possibilities. There, yeah. I mean, and I'm not saying that just to be funny. Um, uh, it's really interesting to get another uh, point of view from somebody because that's something that's never crossed my mind. And it's funny that I say that because on the other side of the coin, Paris is having no problems getting Obris to turn on someone who he's been working with for centuries after yeah. only a couple of weeks. So I'm kind of being hypocritical when I say it, but for me, the whole idea of the character of Anorax easily changing his ways was more surprising to me than his first officer, if that's who he even was. I don't even know if we even got designation of if he was first officer or not with what he did with Paris or what what Paris did with him. You know, it's a classic divide and conquer, good cop, bad cop kind of thing. Yeah. Um, I don't bother yourself with it. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> You're Thank welcome. You. One of the fascinating aspects to this to me is the story of why we we are where we are. 
you know, um, Anorak starts to tell Chakotay of uh, the fact that the weapon ship was used first against a race called the Rilnar. Mm -hmm. And the Rilnar had removed the Krenum Imperium as sort of the dominant force in the region. Yep. And it caused an alternate timeline in which 50 million Krenum died of a plague within a year. So they... It's it's only more appropriate that we talk about this episode this year because essentially the Krenum died of a pandemic. And this occurred because the Rilnar introduced a critical antibody against the disease into the Krenum physiology and their erasure took the antibody with it. So by removing them, it it essentially laid waste to everything. It laid waste to their entire empire, if you will. Yeah. That's... Yep. Uh, you sit back and you think about it in those terms. You know, you talk about the butterfly effect earlier, how the slightest change can have massive effects or like the comet that Chakotay says they should right. remove from the timeline. It, on his test. Yeah, absolutely. And you understand why there are all these calculations and why Anorak spends all this time looking at these converging and, and mixed up timelines and how it's so easy to get it all wrong. Oh yeah, when when I watch this episode, I actually think a lot about the TNG episode parallels. And the reason mm. I do that is because of those charts that Anorax is looking at, and I've talked about this before, when they're in the in the conference room on the Enterprise and parallels and they and Jordy's showing a timeline that splits off and then splits off and you just see these these fingers just coming off in infinite in infinite numbers. It makes me think of that. And that's what he has to do every single time he works on calculations for an incursion. I just love the way that Ober says that. So I'll <laughs> say it like that all the time. Um, every single time they do an incursion, that's what they, he's dealing with, or that's what his crew's dealing with. I got to tell you, I would be so insane. Uh, don't even say it because I know what you're going to say. After just a short time of doing it on this ship, and he's been doing it for God knows how long. I, I don't disagree. I, I, I can't make a joke about that because... I think you're right. I think that I think that that has taken him to where he is today. I mean, there's a there's a scene in this episode where Paris, you know, essentially goes off the rails and and just rants that Anorax is insane to Jacote, and I don't think he's insane. I think that years of conditioning and pain and guilt have done this to him. You know, he lives with every single one of them, and he remembers them all, even though people don't remember any of these species. Yeah or planets, and he carries that around with him. I don't. I think this kind of shows the immaturity of Paris's writing in this episode. I think it's off base for the character at this point of the series. But Anorax is not insane. I think that he's deeply, deeply disturbed. I think he's very ill, and I think exactly it's a very different thing. Yeah, I think that's the, exactly the perfect word. He is disturbed. Insane? No. I don't think anybody uh, who's insane would be able to uh, have the control uh, that he seems to have um, as commander of this vessel. And do we ever have a, is there a name for this vessel? I don't even know if we ever get a name for it. I don't think we do. I will say that it is my favorite of my Eagle Moss ships, which is right over there. I do have the <laughs> Krenum time ship. And I love when it shows up in Star Trek Online. Yeah. <laughs> yes. I actually, um, uh, oh gosh, who gave it to me? I forget who gave it to me. Won it. And he he didn't want it, so he sent me the code for it. So I have a current of time ship in oh, South that's cool. somewhere. I don't think I've ever used it, but uh, but yeah, yeah, pretty cool. Yeah, yeah. We anyway. we talk a lot about the some of the CG effects, and this episode really puts that on display for Voyager. Yeah. Um, my favorite shot of this entire episode. Do you know what it is? Can you guess? I'm not sure. I'm. Is it not the end? Is it? No. Okay, which one is it? With the it's, micro, the micro meteor storm? No, it's Janeway okay. sitting in her captain's chair, looking out through a what? bridge that's got a giant no hole in it. <laughs> yeah, no view screen. Yeah, <laughs> and that happened years before Nemesis, my friends. Right. Um, and that is just such a beautiful shot. If you look at some of the special features on the DVD, you can see some of the the raw footage without the CG in it, mm -hmm. um, and it looks kind of weird. But to see that finished shot, it's like, damn. Yeah. They really, the VFX team really nailed this episode. They brought their A game and then some with us. Yeah. And, and that scene with her looking at the, at the, 
at the non-view screen is right before the end uh, collision with the time ship. And I got to say, that is some pretty impressive work because I don't think that a lot of that was CGI. I think those were real models used, weren't they? Uh, for the crashing into the time ship. I'll have to check to see that, but it sure looks like it. It's hard to say because there are some elements of this that are so clearly CGI. Yeah. yeah. Um, or at least appear to be. I could very well be wrong. Mm -hmm. um, it's it's really tough to say. But still, even let's let's assume it's physical models. Can you imagine how much work and money that is? Yeah. <laughs> that's that's staggering. That's like feature film type work. Right. Um, it's, 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 it's another, it's another example of, we didn't realize it at the time of how special this show was and what they, what they did in it. And looking at uh, memory alpha, I guess it was CGI, um, reading from the production and effects section from the part two, um, entry CGI effects director, Ron Thornton thoroughly enjoyed the opportunity that foundation imaging was given to blow up Voyager for this episode. <laughs> he noted getting the chance to destroy Voyager at the end was very cool. So That's that awesome. kind of puts that to rest. Um, CG totally. That's kind of cool. I like that. <laughs> um, I, I don't want to say it now, but I, I want to make sure that we do talk about it. Remind me when we're wrapping up the episode, a very important thought that takes place near the end or at the very end of this episode. I don't want to forget. Well, I want to talk about the time reset um, since we're getting close to that time anyway. Mm -hmm. No pun intended. <laughs> Funny man. Janeway clearly tells him time's up as she sets a course for Voyager to crash into the, the Krenim time weapon ship. Does she, do you think she knows it's going to reset the timeline or you, do you think she's just making a kamikaze run to take them out? I think she has a feeling that with all of the – she talks about turning the temporal shielding off before they crash into it. So I think she has an idea that it could set everything back to where it should be. That's my own personal thought because if she kept the temporal shielding on, then they wouldn't be protect, they would be protected from any changes. I tend to agree with you. I used to think that she didn't know and it was just luck. Mm-hmm. But in watching the episode again, it's like, oh man, she had this figured out right before it happened. Yeah. She knew exactly what to do. She knew that it would essentially reset them at some point to to a better place. Mm -hmm. I hate to use that phrase because it makes it sound like she's dead. Uh, I guess she was for a second. Um, <laughs> but she she pulls that that giant suicide run into the ship and lo and behold, they're back at day one. And that is just such a great editing job. It is. And it's great continuity. There they are back with the tiny little Krenim ship. And uh, she's like, um, oh, well, let's uh, avoid this place. Absolutely. And, and and since we're talking about it, I'm going to talk about what I wanted to, to remind uh, myself of later. At the end of the episode, after the crash, there's Anorax on Kiana Prime with his wife. Two things come to mind whenever I see this scene. One, if he had blown himself up in the time ship, he wouldn't have had to go through centuries of loss of races because that seemed to be the focal point when you think about it. Mm -hmm. Two, when he walks away from his desk because his wife says it's a beautiful day, come spend it with me, the pad that he's working on has temporal incursion data on it. So is this all destined to be a pre-temporal paradox where it's just going to happen over and over again? Possibly. Yeah. I mean, we know that the Krenim were were famous for having used time. Right. In yeah. that regard, perhaps he was just studying history. Okay. Perhaps he was calculating some brand new weapon. Either way, he, as Kurtwood Smith uh, says, he got the girl at the end, which he, he doesn't often do in his career. <laughs> um <laughs> <laughs> and and it's a great moment honestly what what else is a, what else is a great moment even though i'm kind of confused about the science behind it another dr aaron moment possibly is in the time ship he has that pyramid hmm. that has a lock of her hair sealed in it yeah and when it breaks on the time ship the hair disintegrates so i and that confuses me a little bit because on the time ship, time has no meaning. So should it have, I shouldn't say disintegrate, it it disappears, it fades away from existence. 
should that have happened or not? It, whatever the re, whatever the explanation is, it's a great scene when it falls and yeah. breaks and and disappears, and you see that look on his face. This is some of that that really hanky back to the future time travel crap. <laughs> well, that's one of the reasons why oh. the time travel and back to the future is just terrible. <laughs> I love that movie. Oh, I love the first one. I love them all. <laughs> I, the second one's the second one's is putrid. I knew I knew you and James don't like it too much. <laughs> the second one is putrid. The third one's fun. It is fun, very fun. Um, this this is hands down the best reset button episode of Star Trek of all time. Yes, it is, and I would put the Enterprise um, episode with Twilight uh, Twilight as probably a second, but but it's a far back second. This is the best one without without a doubt. For me it goes Year of Hell, The Visitor. Oh yes, that's right. Twilight. Yeah. And it's it, for me it's like a hair width in between each one. That close for Year of Hell and, and Visitor, yeah. It is because I think it's because we get a a, a more expanded story with Year yeah. of Hell. Yeah. I think because we get two episodes because we really get to dive in on Anorax and understand his motivations and who he is, I think it elevates this episode just a little more for me. Whereas I still think The Visitor is Star Trek's finest hour Agreed. ever. Agreed. I'd, I'd, I can't believe I'm going to say this, but I actually forgot about The Visitor. Yes, The Visitor is right up there. Those three, because with Year of Hell, it's just the great, the great overall two-parter in the storyline. But The Visitor and Twilight are extremely personal character episodes that ha happen to have reset buttons involved in them. The whole to Paul and Archer and then Jake and Ben aspect with, with the visitor. Those mm. are just, those are just so great, but yeah, th it's funny that some people don't like reset button episodes, but here we are talking about that. Those like are the three best, not only reset button episodes, but maybe Star Trek episodes. It's funny because this week I watched, um, Probably what is one of the original reset button episodes, mm -hmm. which is the city on the edge of forever. Right. Um, and there is a, a tonally, there are some things that are very similar to this episode um, in that it's, you don't have a great feeling at the end. Um, you, you watch the visitor and you, I mean, you're a mess of tears, but you understand that <laughs> things have been restored and life goes on. Right. Um, that you understand the pain that Benjamin feels, but you're glad that Jake has his father back and Benjamin has his son. Mm -hmm. At the end of this one, you see that Anorax has his wife back. You see that Voyager is clean and pristine again, but it still feels kind of empty because you know what they went through for the last year. Right. And here's another question. We see that he's with his wife and everything's great. Voyager's back together on day one. What about all those billions that were wiped out before Voyager got involved? Do we ever have any idea if they were restored or are they completely gone too? Well, since his wife is alive, I think we have, have to think. assume that, yeah. that that's restored yeah, to some extent. So. Yeah. Um, it'd be interesting. I don't know if this is ever addressed in a novel. I think it would be a great canvas for, for a novel to be written upon. I'm going to call Dayton as soon as we're done recording. <laughs> <laughs> this could be a series of novels. Get him and Mac and Dilmore uh, on the line. Get that conference call going. Let me know how that goes. I will start working on that right away. Yeah. <laughs> that would be awesome. Do I get a finder's fee? Yes, <laughs> please. <laughs> so it's your please. idea, actually. you kidding me? <laughs> well, uh, buddy, any final thoughts on Year of Hell? I mean, what can you say that you haven't already said? But um, to sort of wrap it up, um, any unfinished thoughts or things you didn't get to bring up that you want a chance to, to discuss? I don't think so. I, I think we hit all the important parts. Um, Kate Mulgrew shines in this as as a Janeway that we're not used to seeing. And I think that's why it's such a strong performance for me. Um, we're used to her being the, the commander of the ship and the mother figure on the ship, so to speak. And in this one, she's not taking anything from anybody. She's got, she's very standoffish. She doesn't have the um, the emotional attachment to really anybody because of, of the this awful year that they're going through it. She does a great job. Kurtwood Smith, uh, I think this is what cemented him for me as one of my all-time favorite guest stars uh, on Trek. Of course, we have we have um, 
excuse me, we have, you know, Wei Yoon and you know, uh, Jeff and, and, and JG and, and Mark Alimo and all those others. That's, that's different. But for people that aren't on the show as much as they were, fantastic. So great to see or to hear him in Lower Decks this season also. Um, it's just, it is, it is an episode that you just, you get so wrapped up in um, and, and, and love so much. And there's a lot of bad things that happen, but you just can't help but love this episode. It is my favorite Voyager episode. And I just, I hope that, uh, I hope that everybody else out there enjoys it as much as I do. And I'd be interested to hear from any listeners who don't like it, why they don't like it. Not that I'd say they're wrong. I'd just be very interested in hearing what those reasons are. Oh, absolutely. Um, before we, we sort of let this topic go for the episode, I do want to talk about one scene that I forgot to bring up. And that is the scene between the doctor and Janeway where he relieves her of command. Mm. To me, it is the the most um, interesting and intricate and weighty episode of, of the second part uh, because it, it introduces some real conflict between these two characters where Janeway essentially spouts all kinds of things, essentially threatening to turn him off. Right. And she apologizes, which she only knows is because he would relieve her of command. Yeah, I think that was kind of a fake apology. I, I do too. Well, I do and yeah. I don't. I think she meant it until just she, she just couldn't keep it in and and he had to relieve her of command. But um, it, granted, the doctor is a construct of the Voyager computer. Yes, he's become his own life form, but let's let's be honest. He's a piece of programming that emanates from Starfleet. Mm -hmm. And the computer is essentially relieving Janeway of command in the form of the doctor. And she's like, yeah, good luck. Yeah. Because uh, I'm not giving up command. And uh, if there's a court martial, I, uh, I'll, I'll take my lumps. It's funny that you bring that up, and I'm glad you did, because earlier when we started talking about part two, I, I kind of mixed two scenes together when she needed the, the trioxin compound, and he, or she needed it, but didn't want it, and he, I, I miss, I misspoke when I said that he threatened to relieve her command then, when it was actually later in the episode, so I'm glad you actually brought that up, because he did relieve her, and she's like, yeah, okay, great, what are you gonna do, put me in the brig? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, they're both destroyed. Exactly. <laughs> and that was no trioxin compound. That was a neural paralyzer. Paralyzer. <laughs> I know it's a triox compound in, yes. in, in a mock time. Yes, yes. Please no emails. Um, <laughs> this is an episode that I can never get tired of watching. Right. The performances are, are, are top shelf. This really, this could have been a Voyager feature film. And I would have paid money 10 times over to see it because it's that damn good. It is. It is absolutely that damn good. It always will. It is, you know, we don't talk about, we don't say this word often when we talk about any of the modern Star Trek. This is a classic and it will always be, in my mind, a classic. Um, one of the other very quick things I wanted to talk about was the performance by John uh, LaPrieno um, as Obrist. I really like um, what he does in this episode, and I gotta say, okay, this is um, this is re my my uh, younger days really coming out because I used to watch General Hospital. But when this episode first came <laughs> on in the '90s and saw him, I like freaked out because he used to be on One Life to Live, and I was like, oh my god, that's the guy from One Life to Live. <laughs> Cord Cord Roberts on One Life to Live, if I remember correctly. How many soap operas did you watch? I didn't really watch that if it was on before General Hospital. So chances were the TV was on before General Hospital started. So, uh huh. Mm -hmm. I'm not buying that at all. <laughs> that's what I got to That's a, that's the truth, baby. <laughs> and Dan, where would we be? I ask you, where would we be without our bands? The uh, without our bands, without our friends, the band Five Year Mission. Mm -hmm. They with so many amazing songs, all about Star Trek. Uh, I, I tell you, I love all their albums. I play them all the time. I am shuffling that playlist usually as I work here in my home office all day long. Um, one song for every episode of the original series. And this isn't parody. This isn't making fun of Star Trek. There are compositions that make you look at these episodes from a different perspective. And that's truly what is beautiful about their stuff. So we want everyone head on out to five mission.net, get all of their CDs. Someone, some Trekkie in your life is going to want these in their holiday stocking. You can even send them to them in the mail if you want to. You don't even have to touch them. You just, I, I'm going to send this to so-and-so and boom, they're gone. Boom. But get all those discs, 
fiveyearmission.net. Show the band the support, and we guarantee you're going to become a huge fan. I would love to just like break out in song with a five-year mission tune, but I can't because the last time I did that, they threw down a lawsuit on me in Vegas. So I'm not going to do that instead. And of course, it was, you know, fun lawsuit. Don't want everybody to get nervous all of a sudden. Unauthorized but, performance is a very serious thing. Very serious. Uh, I, yeah, I know I'm well aware as the um, trial in Vegas showed, uh, or actually the trial on the podcast showed that we were a guest on. And Fark was there and Terry yeah. was there and it was very, very bad. Anyway... <laughs> This man, Bill, is is a legend. It's the only word I can use to describe this person. He is one of the fathers of Starfleet and the Federation because of what he accomplished as an explorer. Before becoming captain, he was a legendary drummer for a band on the North American continent. Then he was commander of a new vessel exploring the deepest reaches of space. He fought Klingons, Romulans, saved the planet from the Zindi, and fought Future Guy in the Temporal Cold War. They're actually thinking of tearing down the Cochrane statue in Bozeman and replacing it with this guy holding his drumsticks high in the air, looking to the future. He is the one and only Captain Jonathan Farcher, legend of Starfleet, legend of the Federation, legend of Star Trek. It like, sounded like I was doing an intro for the podcast, didn't it? It almost sounded like a movie trailer <laughs> for the world's worst movie. Oh, wow. I... Oh. Captain Jonathan Farkcher. Farkcher. Yep. So I, I got a, I have a real question here. Do you yeah, like we go. stay up at night thinking about these things? How do these come to you? All right. Well, here's what I do. I do this every week, and and I don't know. I'm I kind of run out of ideas from time to time. I, don't you tell me you do it sitting on the toilet. No, 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 no. Okay. I will pull up. Uh, I'll just pull up a wiki page of every episode title of all the Star Trek. I'll pick a particular series that I want to use in a particular week, and I'll pull up all the episode titles, and I'll try to figure out something. And if I can't figure out anything with the titles, I'll start looking at the characters, or I'll start looking at the planets involved in all of these episodes. It's a very arduous and important process, Bill, and it's one that I am proud to do because I know that the people want it. Captain Farcher, people. That's what it is this week. Write it down. Remember it. Frame it. Love it. Because we love Fark. And five-year mission. Absolutely. Don't forget, too, you can support the Trek Geeks Podcast Network by subscribing to us on Patreon. We can get all kinds of special exclusive perks there, Dan. Absolutely. Um, we sent out earlier this year our, our awesome annual supporters pin made by our dear friends at Fansets. Our annual t-shirt, which I actually wore yesterday, looks fantastic. It's got all the shows on the back. Those were sent out. You can get a whole bunch of perks when you're a member of our Patreon. Um, right now, we want to take a moment to thank our associate producers for Trek Geeks. We are just so grateful for their support. So thank you, Dave Andrews, Vikram Bhatt, Luke Burnham, Brad DeMag, William Edward M. Jr., Brandon Everett. Andy Fark, Kimberly Francis, Jonathan Hamilton, Brooke Horton, Ryan Jeffs, John Krikorian, Sean Lynn, Rick Mason, Jamie McGregor, Aaron Mollenkoff, Shane Murray, Tim Robertson, Greg Rozier, Eric Sakian, Adam Sanders, Blake Strike, Tim Serdar, Heather Sohn, Lisa Tomlinson, Jessica Dax Vincent, Trey Womack, Ron Robel, and the gracious and wonderful Conrad Hutchins. Well, you really added extra zing to that one today. Zing! That's because Conrad is that gracious and wonderful. Mm -hmm. We also want to thank our Trek Geeks producers for their support. They are Mike Bovia, Chaz Bradshaw, Ken Bird, Kyle Castillo, Peter Craig, Craig Ewing, Al Godwin, Jackie and Chris Hackney, Kimberly Hartman, David Hood, Tony Lambast, Leonel Marchand, Matt McGonigal, Jim McMahon, Charlie Mulvey, Sean O'Halloran, Jamie Rogers, Casey Shafsky, Chris Trebuzio, Ken Tripp, Christina Werther, and the lovely and talented Jess Vashon. I have a feeling we might be talking about uh, her in a minute. But anyway, you too can become a producer on the Trek Geeks Podcast Network, and it is so easy to do. Head on over to patreon.com slash trekgeeks for all the details. Dan, next week, we continue our celebration of Voyager 25 with what Dr. Crater might have called the last of its kind. For Voyager, anyway. Absolutely. You know, like the water buffalo. Uh, or the smile on your face, I would think, right, mm. buddy? Yeah, yeah absolutely. Pretty much. No, I kid, I kid. Yes, uh, you you said it. Uh, our year long celebration of Voyager twenty five is close to wrapping up, and next week we are going to be welcoming one of our closest friends and a producer here on Trek Geeks to help us break down Voyager season seven. Jess Vashon takes the reins of COC referee 
on See It, See It, See It, See It, or Skip It, Skip It, Skip It on Trek Geeks, the flagship of the Trek Geeks Podcast Network. It's hard to believe that the year has gone by this slowly, but also this fast, that we're also at season, season seven of, of See It or Skip It. I know. I, um, I'm looking Amazing. forward to this one. It should be great. Um, I feel bad for Jess that she's got a referee, the two of us. Um, ah. I've known Jess for 40 years. I, um, I can only hope that this, um, this does not impact my friendship. It's all done. Yeah. Great idea, Dan. For even more great Star Trek discussion, please check out the other member podcasts of the Trek Geeks Podcast Network. Of course, in addition to Rewind and Politrex and Five Year Mission and others, you can hear the brand new Deep Space Pride with Mike Thurlow and Johnson Lee, as well as Infinite Trek with Aaron Harvey and Brandy Jackala. You can find all our podcasts, including where to listen, by visiting, dig this, trekgeeks.com slash listen. Digging it. The Trek Geeks Podcast Network. No one talks Trek like we do. And of course, for all the news on all the Star Trek CEO, please visit our great friends at treknews.net, the newly redesigned treknews.net. For now, this has been episode number 241 of the Trek Geeks podcast. We do hope you all live long and prosper. Coconuts up. That, that's, are they? They're up? You're hell, baby. Best line of the whole show. And not you're a coconut? Coconut of hell? Hey, I write the I write the copy. Just press the buttons. Oh, let me press that button right now. Music for Trek Geeks is provided by Five Year Mission. They're writing an original song for each episode of Star Trek. Hear more of their music at fiveyearmission.net. Trek Geeks is a production of Coconut Media Works. Executive producers Bill Smith and Dan Davidson. For more great Star Trek discussion, discover the other shows of the Trek Geeks podcast network at trekgeeks.com or find us in Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or your favorite podcast app. Bing bong. Yeah. Kill Spock. No, I can't vote for it, is it? <laughs> Bing bong. Bing effing bong. Uh, we're like Bing Crosby this time of year. But oh, yeah, well, that's, that's, I like that. That's pretty good. He's got a good baritone, I'll tell you that. He had the best baritone. Hey, he, was a, he was a son of a bitch in real life. I hear. Yeah. But um, as far as his, his ability, his vocal ability... Man, it's just it's you, you. You can't beat him. It's about your face ability. About that good. Wow, I, what does that even mean? I mean, I'm just giving you a compliment because it's not going to last long. So just take it when you can get it. I don't understand it. That's it the means you got a great face. The best, like his baritone voice. Who are you, and what have you done with Dan Davidson? I got a growling dog here. Look at this. Don't growl. I'm recording. I'd growl if I lived with you too. No growling. Oh my God, I think she actually sees Abby on the camera and she's growling at it because she's looking at the camera. <laughs> uh, no, Abby's woofing. People in the outtake are wondering why you're barking and I'm not liking it. Okay. He see, no, you know what it is? She sees you. Know how she barks at you every time you come over? Hmm. She's, she's looking right at you from the camera. Look at her. <laughs> what a it's like she wants to eat my face. Yeah, well, anyway. So you want to hear what happened to me this weekend? As I hear the dog in the background. Sure. Yeah. sure. Hey, I, 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 um, I crashed into a house. Yeah. Um, yeah. I have just so many questions. Yeah. Uh, the first of which is, um, were you riding your broom at the time? I <laughs> man, your broom. That's funny. No, I don't. Have it actually it. was very funny, jerk. No, it wasn't funny at all. It's the Christmas season. Why don't you lighten up? <laughs> My broom I put away after Halloween, you big nimrod. I'm implying that you're a stupid witch. <laughs> no, it was bad weather, and Sue and I were out doing errands, and uh, my truck decided not to take a turn, even though I was only going like five miles an hour in low gear and had the snow traction enabled. Uh, slid 
right off the road in between a telephone pole and the wire that comes down from the telephone pole down a hill, which was the front yard of a home, and we're not able to stop before we smashed into their front step column. Just so you lodging. did stop. <laughs> we did stop. No airbag deployment, <laughs> thankfully. But yeah, it, God almighty, it was scary. It's it's really scary not being in control of your vehicle. Yes. Yeah. There was so. one time when I was uh, I was 18. So on my 18th birthday, I had bought myself a car. And I went from driving an old 74 Ford Pinto station wagon mm-hmm. to an 85 Ford Tempo five-speed. You know, it fit my budget. I came up with the down payment over that summer. On my 18th birthday, I walked into the car dealership the first day. I was legally able to get a loan. And I got a loan. And my car payment was $92 a month. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> I was driving to work at Friendly's one Saturday morning, and it was the first snow of that season. It was November 2nd, um, 1987. And I was going down a hill that spanned two towns, a pretty steep grade. And my town had salted and sanded their end and the other town did not. And there was ice buildup on the other side. And at 13 miles an hour, I kissed a telephone pole straight on, totaled the car. Nice. Wasn't my fault. No. In fact, even the the police officer that responded said, uh, yeah, I can't ticket you for this because I just came down the hill sideways. Yeah, um, the the guy, the same thing for for when the officer was over. He's like, oh, this, nope, not a problem. Everything's going to be approved. No, no, nothing that needs to be written up. I'm like, okay. Yep. So, yeah. Sue I've, says to me, she goes, you know what the scariest part of that whole thing was? Is beforehand you were driving nervously and you never do that. I was, I was nervous driving. It was bad, bad weather. It got bad really it was. fast. I was out. Um, yep. Actually, while that was happening to you, I had no idea. So. Yep. Oh, uh, you want to hear the, the, the funny slash awful part that also happened? As if the crash wasn't bad enough? Knowing your sense of humor, I can't wait to see how yeah. bad this is. So there was somebody behind us who saw the whole thing, but they continued along because they were going to the dump in Merrimack, which is where we were headed actually at the time. But he decided to come back after he was done doing that to A, see if we needed any help, and B, to be a witness for the police officer to say there was nothing that he could have done. That was unavoidable. So he's he parks, and he's coming down the hill that my car went down to come over to us, and he slipped. And we all heard his leg snap, or his ankle as it was, um, broke his ankle. We had to call him an ambulance, and they took him off to the hospital. So why did you take him out? <laughs> <laughs> so we don't need your help. <laughs> <laughs> it went <laughs> like a pencil. Oh, it did. Yeah. As a matter of fact, the homeowner said, um, was that your ankle? And the guy's like, yep. <laughs> so, did that happen on the homeowner's property? Yeah. Oh, my God, because he could sue the homeowner. For coming down a snow-covered hill at his own volition? Well, sure. You can sue anybody for anything these days. I'm well, not saying that's it's right. True. I don't I, I can't imagine he would. He was he was he was not he was he was kicking himself, but even though he really couldn't because he had a broken <laughs> <laughs> If he was a nice enough guy to stop for the likes of you, yeah. Because you were just horrible. Yeah, right. Um, I imagine he would not I was surprised that when he saw him. it was me that he didn't back up his car, speed down and launch off that hill right into my head. So that's what I would have done. I, I am aware. So thankfully you were not in the area. I need to write that down because I just so. said a bad word. <laughs> I didn't even hear what you said. I wasn't listening. <laughs> I said, that's what I'd do. Oh, all right. Well, I'll bleep it twice. That's good. Yeah, I wrote it down. <laughs> all right. You're a good man. Write anyway. in the post-it note with my new password for my work PC. Yeah, yes. Because I'm at home and I can do that. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Until I remember it. Exactly. I usually come up with these very long intricate passwords Mm -hmm. minimum 30 characters it's usually some kind of sentence yeah all kinds of special characters and and the like um no i kept it simple because i'm not going back to the office in in the next six months (laughs) um i met the minimum requirements i I got my pieces of flair this time there you go good for you yeah you get any decorations up yet no, in fact, we uh, we didn't decorate last year. I don't think we're decorating this oh, year. Okay, yeah, we did ours. We got we finally got our tree up. We were going to do it Saturday, but you know, crashing into a house, uh, so we did it Sunday instead. We talked about it uh, several weeks ago, but honestly, we're not exchanging gifts again this year, mm. which I'm fine with. Yeah. Last year we bought ourselves a vacation, which we weren't able to take. Yeah. Um, because thanks COVID. Mm. Um, so we've you know, significantly upped our charitable donations this year. 
Um, we're going to do a nice dinner for ourselves. We think we're going to make beef Wellingtons for Christmas. Nice. Um, but, uh, it's like, I have everything I want. Yeah. You know? Yeah. yeah. We, we, we decorated and we have a, we got a fake tree last year. And, and I gotta say the best part about a fake tree is it took five minutes to put up. <laughs> I great. know, right? <laughs> All the lights are in it. You just basically put each section in the lights yep. automatically are on and it was, it's wonderful. So, so yeah. I still like to put the lights on the tree myself. So I have a tree which assembles very quickly, mm-hmm. like, like you say, but it is not pre-lit. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. so someday when I go back to putting a tree up, mm. that's what I'll do. Okay. Right. I mean, you can hang yourself from it. Whoa. This no, I mean a it, like turn? a swing. A swing. You know, like, you know how you have those ropes the, and, the, and the wood slat on the bottom, like a swing? Yay. From a course, Christmas tree. You probably wouldn't do that from a Christmas tree because you need a branch. So that doesn't make any sense. <sighs> from a Christmas tree. <laughs> <laughs> yep. It's the only holiday where we shove a tree up an angel's ass and celebrate. There you That's go. All I gotta say. Or a Star Trek Enterprise, which I'm not getting, so whatever. Oh, you mean that's the Hallmark a, Topper? That's been made abundantly clear. We will not have that in our house. <laughs> oh my, I'm glad I haven't gotten it for you. Then. <laughs> yeah. Well, if you did, then what could I say? I'm, honey, it's a gift. You know, I, I can't I'm say I'm surprised no. you don't have a separate Trek tree in a different part of the house. We may actually do that. We haven't yet. We definitely have room. We could put like two or three trees in the house because um, it's just the two of us. And I think that um, what I used to do in Yarmouth is all of my ships from the collection would be around the window. Um, I would put Christmas lights around the window and then I would have everything set up, um, all the ships that way. Um, I never have done a tree itself of Trek, but I, I could certainly do that. I think that's just me though. Yeah. Sorry. My phone's ringing in the background. It never rings. It's the president. It's not. (laughs) It's not. No, it's not the president. And then I was looking for my cell phone because I have the app so I can answer my phone (laughs) from my cell phone. Cell phone's not around either. My cell phone's MIA. Uh, Maybe it's in uh, the dog's collar or something. It's not. Squirrel. Sorry. Dog doesn't wear her collar in the house. I meant the cone. Sorry, because I see she has a cone oh. on. So anyway. She does. Yeah. She's so bonehead. there's that. You're a bonehead. <laughs> okay. Okay. We're ready then. Okay. Yeah. See that you are. <laughs> Coconut 